and just as important as going over that and reviewing what we did and so on, I want to make sure that the uh, implications of everything we talked about is clear. All right, so let me download the example that we had last time. Kind of a tr silly sort of example, but uh, I hope it gets the points uh, across. I did see they're replacing the, the, the curtains in some of these rooms. I, I can't wait till they do this one. Because, like, the document camera is virtually useless. So, anyhow. Uh, would it work better if I was able to close the blinds? These blinds might have been here when I went to school here. They might not have been, I mean, but they've been here as long as I've been teaching here, and that's a long time. So the things like to do it are kind of mangled, and even if you do close them, it doesn't close them very well. So you're absolutely right. It would be better if we could close them. I'm just not entirely sure that we could close them. Fortunately, I don't need that today. So... Um, We'll, we'll be okay. All right. One thing I've been meaning to do for a while, but we always seem to have important stuff to talk about, is to talk about dates. So if you're stuck on what to do with dates, review this fun with dates example. That will show you a lot of things that you can do with dates. All right. Here's the example we had last time. And just to review our classes, we had a pet class, a unit test class, which doesn't really count in the scheme of things, a pet class, and a dog class. The pet class was defined as an abstract class. What does that mean either in, either in technical terms or in real world lay people sort of terms? What does it mean when we say that a pet, the pet class here is defined as an abstract class? Okay, you can instantiate this object. You can't make an object from this template. All right, it's, it's a real thing, but nothing exists on this level, sort of, of the inheritance chart. All right. So it's uh, just a template that other made so that other classes can inherit it. Because other classes can inherit it, right. An abstract class that doesn't have anything inheriting from it is useless. All right. What we're saying in this case is there's nothing that is only a pet. Everything that exists in the real world is some subclass of pet. So we, do, we don't have anything that we can define only as a pet. Certainly we have things that are pets, but they're dogs that are also pets. There's cats that are also pets, and so on down the line. So that's what we mean sort of by this, which means that I can't say pet P equals new pet just not allowed to do it, and the compiler will give us an error. I think we tried that on the test case. Let me open up the test case, and we'll try it again to show you uh, that. I can't say pet D equals new pet. If I try to do that and compile it, I'm going to get an error.
gives us an error. Pet is abstract, cannot be instantiated. So I can't create an instance of the class pet because pet is an abstract class. So what that means is I can't have pet as new pet and the constructor. I can't use that syntax, new pet, because that's creating an instance of the class pet. All right? I can do this. Pet s equals new dog. All right? Because I'm not making an instance of a pet, I'm making an instance of a dog. And I'm storing the pointer to that dog in a pet pointer. And I'm allowed to do that because a dog is a pet. So I can point to a dog using a pet pointer. All right? So that is legit. And if I run it, I will get the proper methods. Spot says bow wow. This is the food that dog eats. Dogs eat. All right? I'm not allowed to say this, though. All right? Because the pointer P, all I know is it's pointing, all I know is that pointer points to a pet. And not every kind of pet has a catch frisbee method. So I can't say this. Pretty soon we're going to make a cat class. And that cat class doesn't have a pet pointer on it. So I could create a uh, I could create this variable and point to a dog. I could create the I could recreate a new cat variable and point s to it. I can do that. So like after I create the cat class, I could do this, s equals new cat. And that's legal, right? Simply creating a new cat object and pointing to it by the variable s. That statement doesn't work because I can't guarantee there's a dog in that. There might be a dog initially put in there, but there could be a branch in the code that by the time you get to this statement, S is no longer pointing at a dog and it's pointing at a cat. I can't guarantee that that's not going to happen. Therefore, the compiler says, hey, I can't call this S catch frisbee method because all I know is that S is a pet. I don't know for sure that S is a dog. Well, if there's no template for the bird class, it would it would definitely fail. Because okay. we don't even know for sure that a, a bird is a pet, okay. right? If there's no class for it. Okay. What would make this work is if I said this. And I created a dog class, right? I created the dog class last time. If a, the S is going to always point to a dog, then I can ask the dog to catch the frisbee. Because then the compiler knows that S has to point to a dog. All right? And therefore, the function catch frisbee is available for it. All right? So if I do this, though, all the compiler knows is that S is, pe is pointing to a pet. And I don't know for sure that, pets, that all pets can catch frisbees, because there's no method on the pet that says catch frisbee or otherwise. So therefore, this is also going to give me a compile error. It can't be cat frisbee. So there's no method cat frisbee on pet, and therefore, this fails with the compile error. Because the compiler doesn't know for sure that even though we created it as a dog, all the compiler knows is that S points to some kind of pet. All right? We have to verify that, yeah, it is indeed pointing to a dog. And then we can go and compile it 
and run what we want to run. All right. Another way to put it is how it's created determines, well, let's, let's put it this way. How the pointer is declared, the variable type or the class type of the pointer determines what functions are available. So if I say pet s, then the only functions that are available are the functions that exist on the pet or any of its ancestors, if there was an ancestor for pet. All right? So if I declare a variable with a certain type, that limits to what methods we can call on that variable. I can only call functions on that class that have been defined as part of the pet. However, the version of the function that we're going to get depends on exactly what kind of pet we create. So we're going to create a cat in a minute here. If we create a cat and put it in that pointer s for a pet, then it will only allow us to call the methods that exist, exist for the pet, but we'll get the cat version of them. Whereas if we create a dog, we'll get the dog version of them. All right? Make sense? All right. So let's go and create a cat. my unit test like this for now. I'm going to open up the dog. Um, let's look at the dog. We said it extends pat. All right. Remember that when you extend a superclass, you do not get the constructors. Constructors are not inherited. Therefore, we need to put a constructor on the dog. And remember that before a subclass is created, the superclass part of it has to be created as well. So when we call the constructor on dog, it's first going to call one of the constructors on pets. And in our case, we say we want the constructor on pets that accepts an argument for the name and an argument for the weight. So that's what super means. Call your super classes constructor. And in this case, this is what it is. Now, the functions are defined as abstract in here has to be implemented in a subclass with one tiny catch. We'll save that catch for a minute from now. So if I've defined in the class an abstract function for make sound, I better have a function with that signature, with that return value and name and arguments in the dog class. Because if I don't, I'm not going to compile. And it will tell us dog is not, ab not abstract and does not override abstract method. Effectively, when we create an abstract method, we say that every real thing in this category has some method for making a sound or has some method for doing this or doing that. And therefore, anything we create an instance for, any concrete class as opposed to an abstract class, has to have, um, has to have that method coded in it or in one of its other ancestors. So for example, if I had a class called dog and I had a subclass of little dog, all right, or something like that, I wouldn't have to implement the method in little dog if I implemented it in dog. All right. This is kind of where we left off last time in a nutshell. Any questions about this? Let's make our cat class two. If you did the example that you're talking about with little dog, would that, that um, method would be available from little dog? It would be available. In fact, let's go and do that. 
let's make a let's make a little dog method or, or a class. We'll make a public class lap dog extends dog. Now remember, you don't get the constructor, so we have to create a constructor. Lap dogs and regular dogs all eat the same food and all catch frisbees the same way. If that's not true, we'll pretend it's true. But lap dogs make a different sound than regular dogs. Lap dogs don't go bow wow, they go yip yip. All right. So notice I don't have the get food method. Even though it was an abstract method in get food. The reason I don't need to because the dog has the implementation of that method. So I don't have to put it in the yip dog method because one of the ancestors took care of that requirement. The bottom line is I can instantiate something if there's sort of an abstract method out there hanging that no one below it in the inheritance chart has, has implemented. All right. So I can instantiate a pet because it's abstract by definition. I can instantiate a dog because it implements the get food or, or yeah, get food and make a sound. Now on the lap dog level, I don't have to implement either of those two functions because the dog took care of that. But I can override it if I need to. So a yip dog makes a different sound than a dog. And I can go and I'll change my test to make a yip dog. Then we'll ask you to make a sound and can I say pet s equals new lap dog? Is that legal? Guesses? Currently it is. Okay. I'm not sure what currently means, like if we wait till... Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not, you know, like at 1.30 it's going to stop working, you know. No. Yeah, this is, this is legal. Why is it legal? Because I can store a pointer to a lap dog in a pointer that's defined as a pet. Because a lap dog is a dog, and a dog is a pet. Therefore, indirectly, a lap dog is also a pet. A lap dog is dog, dog is pet. So I can store a pointer to a lap dog in a variable with the class type of pet. I call the constructor, I can pass it to it, and I can therefore call the make a sound and get method. The make a sound is going to get it, the method from the lap dog, right? The get food is going to call the method on the dog, right? Because there's no get food method defined on the yip dog. When I call a constructor, I have to go all the way up the chain. So my constructor for lap dog is going to call the constructor for dog, which is going to call the constructor on pet. So. I lied. No, I just forgot to save everything. So spot says yip yip. Table scraps, dog food, pretty much whatever they can. All right. Now, same thing applies. I can't say. this because all I know for sure is that S is a pet. I can guarantee that S is a pet. Therefore, I can guarantee that there's a get sound method and a get food method. I can't guarantee that there's a catch frisbee method, though, because not every pet can catch a frisbee. We've only defined dogs as being able to catch a frisbee. Therefore, we would get a compile for error for this on a lap dog for the same reason we would get 
a compilation error when we compiled it for dog. Okay? Now, there was one other thing that we looked at last time. If I reverse this and say, let's say, lap dog s equals new dog spot 45. I don't know, 45 pounds is a big lap dog, right? But maybe it's for a big person that has a big lap. I don't know. Is that legal? Fifty-fifty chance. No. It's not legal. Why not? Okay. Yes. What you're creating a dog and you're storing a pointer in it that says that it's a lap dog. All dogs are not lap dogs. All right? Therefore, I can't point to a dog object with a pointer that is meant for a lap dog. The reverse I could do. That is legal because all lap dogs are also dogs. So I, something that's meant to point to a dog, that's valid, because a lap dog's a dog. So that pointer can hold a pointer to a dog, but a lap dog pointer must point to a lap dog. Can't point to just a generic dog. So what you def define on this side is the pointer. Whatever you create a new of, you have to make sure that that is one of this. And a dog is not necessarily a lap dog. All right? There are dogs that are not lap dogs. Therefore, this is not valid. OK, let's make a cat and really confuse things. So I'm going to go and create a new file. public class pet, or cat extends pet. Here's my constructor for cat. Because remember, when you're creating a subclass, you first create the superclass part of it, and then you create the subclass. So I can't do any code to initialize a cat until I have first called the code to initialize a pet. If I don't have this, what's going to happen? I'm going to get an error on compilation because pet is an abstract class, cat inherits from it, and cat is not an abstract class, and yet it doesn't implement make sound and get food. So if I go and save that, cat is not abstract and does not override abstract methods. Get food. All right. So as predicted, we got an error. Now, I'm going to throw a twist in here, and I'm going to make cat an abstract class. OK? Why? Well, because there's all kinds of cats in the world, right? There's house cats, and then there's like big cats, like tigers and mountain lions and stuff like that. All right? So I'm going to make cat an abstract class, all right? Because I want to make sure that I can't just create a cat. I have to create one of the specific kinds of cats for my application. So I'm going to say that public abstracts 
extends pet. And that's all I have. Will this give me a compile error? No, because I can't instantiate cat anymore. Therefore, it's not a problem that make noise and get food uh, are not defined on this level. Um, I must have forgot to save it. Not a problem, it compiles it. So now, I'm going to go and create a house cat, let's say. That extends cat. My constructor is again going to pass simply up to the ancestor. And my make sound is going to be meow. The food is going to be depends on the day, right? because house cats are finicky. And I'm going to create, if I remember right, I had a public method of ignore you. Wish I knew my emoticons better. Does that look like a cat ignoring you? Or maybe... This? I don't know. Doesn't really matter. I shouldn't agonize over this. So, I'll store this as a house cat. All right. And compile this. Well, first I want to go to my unit test, pet s equals new cat. What's going to happen if I do that? Okay. Right, right. It was going to give me an error because I can't create an instance of a cat because cat's an abstract object. So, Cat is abstract, cannot instantiate. Okay, fine. Let's make a new house cat. All right. Now what's going to happen? Why is that? Okay. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay. Uh, well, let's see. And it compiles. Remember, when you're an abstract class like this, 
your abstract methods have to be implemented on your subclasses. Or your subclasses themselves have to be abstract classes. But your concrete classes, if they carry through the promise and implement those abstract methods, they could have other methods as well. Absolutely. So I can create a ignore you method on a cat, and that's just fine that it wasn't on the pet or the cat. All right? And it compiles, and if we run it, it's going to give us the good results. I think, thinking of what you said, that's going to happen when we uncomment this line and put ignore you there. Well, the difference is, is you're not actually calling it, right. So these functions exist on the level of pet, so I can call them. If I try to call a method that doesn't exist on the level of pet, that's when I get the error. So if I go and run this, spot says meow, and what they eat depends on the day. Sounds about right. Now here if we say s ignore you, Now we're going to get the compile error for the reason that you described. In fact, if I do this, I'm going to get the compile error for the reason you described. Because likewise, cat doesn't have a ignore you method. However, if I said house cat, now my pointer has it. And now I'm not going to get an error. And everything works the way that we'd want it to. All right. Now. Again, the difficulty is like this. If I declare this pointer as a pet, up to this point, it's a cat, and it's going to do house cat things. But if I were to say s equals new Hard to do that. All right. It's going to be doing cat things here. I see by the time this instruction hits that there's still a house cat in there because look, I've changed that house cat to a dog. So because I can't guarantee by the time the statement is, is hit that there definitely is going to be a class that has a method of ignore you. Because I can't guarantee that, it's going to give me an error, all right? No matter where that line is. All I can guarantee if I declare it as a pet is that I can call the methods that exist on the pet or any of the pet's ancestors. That's my only guarantee, all right? And therefore, any methods not defined on the pet that are defined on one of the subclasses, if I try to call them, I'm going to get a compile error, okay? Questions about that? Now, here's a great word for words with friends or Jeopardy or quiz shows or if you ever take the GRE or, or whatever. The word is polymorphism. All right? Um, I think it's from Greek. What does poly mean? Many. Many. What does, what's morph mean? M-O-R-P-H. Change. Change? Morphing is often talked about as changing. They talk about like doing a morph in animation or whatever. But morph, the, the root morph means form. Yes. So, so a, a morph is to change the form of something. So polymorphism means a class can take many forms. All right? 
So watch what we do here. I'm going to create an array list. that consists of pets. Raylist that consists of pets. I'm going to create a bunch of pets. I'm going to create a bunch of animals. So, dog D equals new dog spot weighs 45. Lapdog LD equals new lapdog spike and it weighs two pounds. That'd be a small dog, but that's the point. Don't you love, by the way, that when people give real small dogs like tough names? My, my one daughter's friend had a dog named Spike that was like this big. Okay, I exaggerate, but it was like this big. This little tiny dog was called Spike. But I think because of that, it thought it was tough. So it would always bark and growl at you like it, like it was, it was going to tear you to shreds if it had the chance. Where really the worst it could probably do would be chew up my shoe, right? Because that's about as high as it could reach. All right, so we create a second one. I'm going to create uh, a cat. Well, I can't create a cat. I'm going to create a house cat. Named in honor of the office. We'll name it Sprinkles. That weighs seven pounds, let's say. So I got I got three pets, right? Can I do this? Can I add to my array list of pets the dog object? Sure. Okay, don't see why not. Can you can you give the explanation of why you think you can do that? Absolutely correct. Your array list is an array of pets. That means it can contain any sort of pet that you throw at it. Dogs are pets based on our inheritance structure. Therefore, I should be able to add a dog to that list. And that would apply for all of these. So I can add the dog and I can add the cat. Well, let, let's see. No spoilers, okay? I'm not going to give a spoiler. We're going we're gonna to discover this together. And then we'll go back to our word of the day, polymorphism. One thing i got to do is I have to import the array list. So. I actually had a question about um, importing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
it just it, it would make compiling a little more efficient if you just specified the ones individuals that you want to import. Oh, okay. So there's some overhead because yeah, a li little tiny bit of overhead at compile time. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So now I'm going to do a loop that says for int i equals zero. I is less than pets dot size. I plus plus. This is sort of our syntax for looping through a array list, an array list. All right. Pat x equals pets sub i, pets get i rather, and then x makes sound, x get food. All right? It looks correct to me. I will compile it, make sure I didn't make any typos or omissions or whatever, and then we'll run it. All right, Spot says bow wow, eats table scraps, dog food. Spike says yip yip, eats table scraps, dog food, pretty much whatever they can. Sprinkle says meow, depends on the day. Okay. So, what does this relate to polymorphism? Many forms. The pet can take many forms. And the version of the function that you get, which is effectively what you were asking a minute ago, the version of the function you get depends on exactly what object is created. Remember the difference between the object and the pointer. All right? If I were to say, oh, I guess I have to try to write on this. Now, uh, no, I won't write on this. Hmm. Let me do this. I hope you can see this. I'm trying to see if you can. Remember, there's a difference between the pointer and the object itself. If I say, <laughs> pet p equals new dog. Remember, let's ask what that statement actually does. It creates on the heap. And at a certain memory location. And constructor going up the constructor chain, it first calls the constructor on pets, then calls the constructor on dogs, and when you're done, you got a dog object here. So you have a dog at a certain place in memory. Pet P equals that means that in the state, you have a very P that points to that location, which is what I write down at that. So this pointer can hold any kind of pointer to any kind of pet object that you have. In this case, it holds a pointer to a dog object because new dog is what determines what created in the heap. So that determines what kind of object we actually have. Pet P determines what kind of pointer we have to it. So there's a difference between the kind of pointer we have and the kind of object we have. Our pointer is a pet pointer, which means that this can point to any pet that exists. However, in this case, 
what it points to is a dog object. That's why I can't say, by the way, p.catchFrisbee. Because p is a pet. If it's a pet pointer, I can only do pet things with it. All right? I can't do dog things with it. I can only do things that are defined on the pet level. Now, when I call the map on this to make sign, I can do that because that's defined on the pet level. And what version of the get sound method does it get? It gets the version of that method that is defined for a dog. All right? That's exactly what polymorphism is. The fact that this pet class, or this pet abstract class, or this method that we call here, make sound, get food, can take a variety of different forms and call a variety of different functions depending on how the object was created. So again, difference between the pointer and the object itself. All right? I can put all of these in this array list because all this array list depends on is that we have a pet. So I can add a dog to the pet list because a dog is a pet. I can add a lap dog to it because a lap dog is a pet. And I can add a, 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 cat, a house cat to it because a house cat is a pet. That being said, as I go through the array list and I grab those objects off, all right, I am getting um, back the kind of object that it was originally created as. So I'm getting a pointer in my pointer, in my pet pointer, the first time through I'm getting a dog object. Now I can only call pet methods because that's the kind of pointer I have. But I'm going to get the dog version of those pet methods because that's the kind of object I actually literally created. All right? It is, it is one of those things that, like, the first pass that you hear it is kind of confusing. But after you give it some time to absorb and go through the examples and play around with making changes and see what happens. Like, what would have happened if I were to change this array list instead of saying of pets to say dogs? What would happen? Well, I'd get a compile error on this line. Because I could put a dog in my array list of dogs. I could put a lap dog in my array list of dogs. But I can't put a cat in my array list of dogs. All right? And so on. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, you can summarize that by saying you can put an object or any kind of object that inherits from that object in the same array. Yes, exactly. You can put that class, or more relevant here, because it's an abstract class, you can put any subclass of that. Why can you do that? Because the subclass passes the is a test. A dog is a pet. So I can put dogs in my pet list because dogs are pets. Cats are pets. Lap dogs are pets. So I can put those in an array list for pets because it passes the is a test. Now the reverse isn't true. I can't put a pet in an array list of dogs for a couple reasons because not all pets are dogs. Were you going to add something to that? Exactly. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't put a. Uh, will be an example. Um, you know, a a. Uh, yeah, a date would be a good example, or a a sales rep, or um, something like that. Because those aren't pets. All right. Questions about this. This is really getting into some powerful stuff that's important as we go forward. Um, we have a few more things to talk about with this, um, and we'll continue um, next week. All right, any questions as of now? All right, we'll see you up in lab. Let me grab these files and post them, then I'll be up to unlock the door if it's not already unlocked.